I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, as I was sharing uh, with Denzel and his wife, I actually spent a brief period of my early life in Minnesota. My father uh, was asked to be the Bible teacher and the dean of boys, they called it back then, at our academy at Maplewood. And so I actually spent some time as a young person going to the elementary school. There was a, literally a two-room schoolhouse. And each grade, first grade was in one row, second grade in another, and so forth. I was in the fifth and sixth grade, as I remember. And uh, my wife, April Heim, she, her uh, grandfather was a principal at Maplewood. So we both have this kind of interesting uh, past with Minnesota and Hutchinson, Minnesota. And I have fond memories of that. Being a kid, not having to shovel the snow like my father did, I enjoyed the snow and the ice and learning how to ice skate and everything. Uh, we then returned to California, where I spent most of my life. I was actually born in California, nice, warm, sunny state. Uh, but ultimately, we were asked to uh, come to uh, Michigan, sort of like Minnesota, back into the snow and cold winters, where we've been uh, working at the Institute of Archaeology there for uh, nearly 40 years now. So I'm getting to be one of my artifacts. After I'm finished, I think they'll put me in the museum. We'll see what happens. Anyway, um, we've always been interested, of in course, uh, at the seminary at Andrews University in showing how archaeology illustrates and support the story of the Bible. That's always been a big thing with me. I don't have time to tell my whole story today, but this was very important to me. And so I ultimately ended up going into graduate school uh, in the field of Near Eastern archaeology, specifically Syro-Palestinian archaeology, with a very famous archaeologist. I mentioned him, I think, in one of my early presentations, William Deaver, the dark prince of biblical archaeology, so to speak, and uh, had a wonderful time learning from him and uh, experiencing many seasons of excavation in Israel. We ultimately then went on to Jordan, and I've worked in uh, Jordan for probably over 30 years at an Israelite site there called uh, Bezer. Tel Jalul is the modern name near Heshbon, near Mount Nebo, where Moses first saw the promised land across the, uh, the Jordan River Valley below, the Dead Sea and all of that. So I spent many years working there. But we also did projects in, uh, on the island of Cyprus, a very important island also, mentioned in the Bible under the name Kedem. It's mentioned in Numbers and Daniel for a couple of examples. And then uh, recently we started working in Sicily at the earliest Christian church built uh, on that island after Constantine the Great proclaimed that Christianity was now okay. He had an edict of toleration and Christianity was able to come out of hiding, so to speak, and they started building their first public churches. Prior to that time, as you were saying, in Sabbath school in Ephesus, they were meeting in people's private homes. And they usually picked the person that owned the biggest house and they would go there wherever they could fit in and that's how they shared fellowship. So we've been working there, just published the results of that eight years of excavation, learned a lot about the early Christian community. So while I was doing all of this work, working in different countries, New Testament period, early church, Old Testament, um, I had some friend of mine, a pastor, Jerry Lafay, called me. I think he had a church in Virginia. He'd been in Berrien Springs prior to that time. And he said, I want you to talk to one of my members. Uh, I said, yes. He says, he thinks uh, he knows where Noah's Ark is. Now, when you're an archaeologist, if you are looking for two things in particular, the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments, or Noah's Ark, both mentioning Ark because Ark refers just basically to a box-shaped structure, small box, little Ark, uh, big box could be the Ark that people floated in. Uh, that's considered sort of pseudo-archaeology. If you want to not be taken seriously in archaeology, very quickly just say, I'm looking for Noah's Ark, or I'm looking like Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Because uh, as I was sharing in my early presentation, first of all, most uh, archaeologists who don't believe in God would say this never happened, these artifacts don't exist, and if you're looking for that, you're just treasure hunting. Archaeologists don't just go out looking for treasure. We have a scientific approach. We go to a site. We excavate it scientifically using very careful methodologies. Everything's recorded carefully. And all of your results are peer-reviewed by other archaeologists to make sure uh, that you understand what you're finding, that you're interpreting it correctly. It's all done very carefully, and you publish it very carefully. And archaeologists just not like the movies. They don't just go out looking for treasure. That's actually, they call it archaeology with a K, A-R-K, archaeology, like the Ark instead of A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y. That's the normal way we spell archaeology. So I've had many people come to me through the years saying, hey, I know where the Ark of the Covenant's located, 
or I know where Noah's Ark is and so forth. When we've done a little preliminary checking into that, it turned out that these were not true stories. Just like today, we have a lot of fake news, there's often fake science as well. And uh, I had learned that people uh, with a lot of enthusiasm will see things that aren't there or their imagination will, you know, uh, create some wonderful stories. So I was always a little dubious. I do believe in the Bible, and I do believe in the Ark of the Covenant, and I do believe in Noah's Ark. That is not the issue, but some people in enthusiasm who don't have training will uh, misinterpret things. They'll see rocks and think they're something else, or uh, sort of like seeing clouds and you see a, a poodle or a dragon or something like that. And so we've seen a lot of this. And so I was a bit dubious, but this was a pastor friend of mine. And so he said, this guy seems to be pretty serious, and he seems to know what he's talking about. Former military officer who's a pilot in the Afghan war, flew a helicopter, I think. And uh, he's a serious guy. He's joined the Adventist church, and he's been shown some things, and I think you ought to look at them. So I said, okay. So they drove over to Andrews University, and he showed me, he spent about three hours with me, showing me pictures, photographs. He had two friends with him saying that these were pictures taken on the traditional Mount Ararat in eastern Turkey. Its Turkish name is called Arida. It looks like Agri Doggy. It means the mountain of pain. And that's a good name for it because climbing up that mountain over the sharp volcanic rocks, it's a big ordeal. It takes two days, three days to get up to the top of the mountain because it's so high, it's the tallest mountain in that part of the Middle East. You know, you have Mount Everest and further east, but uh, this mountain is just about 17,000 feet high. When you get to about one, uh, 10,000 feet, the air starts getting pretty thin, and you have to climatize. You have a low camp there, and you get used to the thinner air, and then you climb up to the higher camp where uh, you get close to the peak. And, th and that's a pretty grueling thing. I've done it twice. And uh, at my age, that's a, a fun challenge to do. Uh, but uh, I was a bit uh, dubious. But they showed me all these pictures. And what they were showing me were underground chasms, if you will, under considerable rock and ice, lots of timber, lots of wood that was clearly in the photograph, worked by hand. This was hand-hewn, human-hewn wood. Okay, And uh, in some of the pictures, they even showed what appeared to be the inside of a room and the interpretation that the lay people who found this, they thought this might be the residue of Noah's Ark. And as I looked at those pictures, I said, for me to Denzel over there on the pew and maybe even longer, and some of them were fastened together, no nails at all. And so this was rather interesting. Other colleagues of mine, professional archaeologists, not really Bible believers, uh, they looked at it, and they thought there might be something archaeological there worth investigating. They didn't know what it was. Uh, the fact that it was on Mount Ararat, of course, evoked all sorts of popular imaginations that maybe Noah's Ark has been found. A real archaeologist, though, doesn't jump to conclusions. What we have to acknowledge is what we can see. Now, I, of course, am a believer, so I have a slightly different methodology. I factor God into my understanding of the world and uh, the fact that he has given us a reliable history in the Bible. So that does, of course, influence my thinking. Other scholars feel that having God involved is unadmissible because we can't put God in a laboratory or in a microscope, or in a test tube under a microscope and examine that. So that's one philosophical approach. And, of course, I was trained to work with uh, that kind of a, an approach, even though I, I uh, didn't really uh, accept the idea that there could be no God in the universe. So... Uh, they all agreed, though, that there was something really up there, and so things developed. I thought, well, maybe it's worth taking a look at, and so I was introduced to some people, actually Kurdish people, who had originally discovered this on the mountain. Eastern Turkey is sort of a popular destination, particularly for mountain climbers, because it has mountains in the east. They're called the Mountains of Uratu. There was an ancient kingdom called Uratu, and that's where the Bible name Ararat comes from. It's a Hebrew pronunciation of this ancient kingdom of Uratu. And it's a very mountainous area, and the biggest mountain of all of them is Arida, which many people have called Mount Ararat. Um, I have to also tell you, I don't have time now, maybe this afternoon we'll have more time, but we had to ask the question, where is the biblical Ararat? Because in the Hebrew it says the ark landed on the mountains, with an S, plural, 
of Ararat. So it could be any one of hundreds of mountains in that area, and they're all very, very tall. But it turns out that Arida at uh, nearly 17,000 feet is the tallest of all of them. It's an extinct volcano, actually, and this is rather interesting. A question that I had is, could the ark have landed on a volcano during the flood or at the end of the flood? Certainly the volcanic action would have had to have stopped. So I had a lot of questions, but these Kurdish guys had found this, and I told my friend, how do you know it came from that mountain? How do you know it? They didn't make just a building uh, in a studio and take pictures, or how do we know the wood didn't come from another location? And so he gave a camera to the Kurdish guy that made the original discovery and said, would you take more pictures for me? And the Kurdish guide, he was a mountain guide, he said yes. The camera was geared so that it had a GPS setting in it, and I don't know that the guide knew that, but he went up and took pictures. When we got the pictures back, we could actually tell exactly where the pictures were taken. They were on Arida Mountain, they were up at the top. So we knew that they were up there and finding something. And so I was eventually invited to go see for myself. I don't have the time to go through all the details. It's quite a process. As a professional archaeologist, I have to make sure our work is done legitimately. I'm not just out treasure hunting. You have to get proper permissions. You have to get permission to climb the mountain, climbing permit. Uh, if you want to use a drone, you have to get a special permission for that. If you want to extract samples, you have to get an archaeological permit. So I've been spending the last several years getting the right permissions, meeting government officials, meeting university professors. I found one of the best professors of Eastern Turkey, uh, Professor Akte Belli, professor of archaeology at the University of Istanbul, and he's been working there for 40 years. We've become friends, and he's joined our project, and he's very interested in what's going on uh, on Mount Ararat. He's very interested in the story of Mount Ararat and the story of Noah's Ark as an academic. And so we've been working together. In fact, we just had a book come out two days ago, uh, 700 pages about all the research that's been done by archaeologists in eastern Turkey concerning Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark. Some of the stories that we've collected are true, some are not, but we have all sorts of wonderful photographs of all the various claims. And we're hoping to share this in just two weeks at a special meeting at the uh, Agri University, which is near Mount Ararat. Professors are coming from all over Europe and Turkey, and we're going to start discussing this issue and hopefully make a project with the proper permissions to go up in the mountain and do official collecting of samples. What I will do today is show you what we've been doing so far. I'll show you some of my climbs, climbs of some of my colleagues. I had some friends just up there working for my team just a couple weeks ago and they were taking drone shots of the area. So I don't have those pictures yet. Uh, I think they're still on my computer. I haven't got them downloaded. But I'll show you what we know so far about this. Now, obviously, if this was Noah's Ark, this would be rather a shattering news because it would support one of the major Bible stories. There are several stories in the Bible that we kind of consider the big stories, creation being the first story right off the bat. People that believe in God believe that God created the world the heavens and the earth and all the life forms. People that don't believe in God believe in the theory of evolution. The second big story comes a little bit later in the first, uh, first books of Genesis. That would be the story of the flood itself. Uh, because the world became so wicked, God felt compelled to have to destroy the wickedness through a worldwide flood. But a small number of people were able to survive that flood by riding out on an ark that God gave instructions to a man named Noah to build to save not only humanity, but also uh, the key animal, uh, representatives of the animal kingdom so that after this terrible destruction, uh, the earth could be repopulated. The next big story after the patriarchal period, of course, is the story of the Exodus, where the Israelites become enslaved and uh, they are uh, able to escape after a period of 430 years and they escape into the promised land. That's a major story. So you've got creation, you've got the flood, you've got the Exodus story, and then, of course, you got the various prophets, and probably the fourth big story would be the appearance of the Son of God on planet Earth, Jesus Christ, of course. So people who don't believe in God contest all of these stories, of course. It's hard to contest the existence of Jesus Christ because we have actual contemporary or near-contemporary records of people, Romans, for example, writing about Jesus. You know, they say there's this guy called Christ, and he's running around claiming to do these miracles. So we actually have evidence that such a person existed. The question really for intellectuals who aren't sure about God is, was he really the son of God? So that's one of our big points. 
for Moses in the Exodus. Uh, big debate about that as well. Many people don't believe that happened. I talked a little bit about that, I think, last evening. Uh, but uh, I think there was an Exodus, and that's one of the big archaeological debates that's going on. And moving back, what about the flood? Was the world really covered by you know, water? Was uh, life on the planet destroyed? The Bible indicates in its Hebrew language very clearly it was a worldwide flood not a local flood a lot of people are just looking for a small flood maybe in the Euphrates Tigris you know Mesopotamian river valleys so uh, if you can actually find an archaeological artifact like the ark that would be a major discovery and would be extremely controversial so with that kind of background we'll go for a few minutes and show you where we are at in our research right now where we are I shouldn't say where we are at uh, that's a dangling whatever it is. But anyway, where we are. So these are some of the people I've been working with. This picture was taken in the capital of Turkey, Ankara. This sort of has a little bit of a sad note to it because I, you can see I'm in the center being photographed with some of my team and some of the people that are working with us. We actually had a meeting in their National Museum of Archaeology. And uh, I've been meeting with uh, different uh, groups of professors and government officials at various universities. This is one of our meetings. You see the lady in red on the right. Uh, you heard about the tragic earthquake in Turkey uh, a few months ago. She was actually, I met her, she was wanting to join my project and she was killed at the, in the earthquake after the meeting. She went down to see her family in southern Turkey. She actually lived in Ankara, as I understand, and she went down to visit family and the earthquake struck and she was killed there. So that brings the things you see in the news to life kind of in a personal way, because Turkey seems a long ways away, but here we had to uh, confront this tragedy. Now, what about Mount Ararat? I have a different talk about how do we know this is the right mountain. Uh, the short story is uh, the Armenians who live around Mount Ararat, they call it um, Masis or Mashu. It's from the uh, ancient name we find in the Gilgamesh epic where Gilgamesh is looking for Noah and he goes to the mountain of Mashu. That's another name for Ararat. And the Turks, uh, I mean, sorry, the Armenians call it Masis, which means twin. It's a mountain that has two peaks. And there's one mountain like that in all of eastern Turkey that fits that description. And this is Arida, the mountain of pain, also called Ararat by many people. And the reason it's uh, called the twin mountains is because there's two volcanic peaks. That's sort of an unusual thing. In the wintertime, it gets very cold there. You can see these mountains are covered with snow. There's a couple of glaciers, one on the top. Our main mountain we're interested in one is called Greater Ararat, and that's on the right-hand side. I don't know if my light will work. You can barely see a little green light there. But that's Greater Ararat. The smaller mountain to the left is Lesser Ararat. This mountain was so famous that before 2000 BC, uh, the ancient Mesopotamian people were making cylinder seals and they were claiming that the gods, their gods, lived on top of this mountain. And they show pictures of them on top of the Twin Peaks. And the Twin Peaks are very clear in the artistic representation. So in their mind, that's where all the gods and where the god of water that caused the flood lived was on top of this mountain. The sun god lived up there too. And that's kind of interesting. They identified this mountain uh, very early on. Paradise in Gilgamesh epic is described as being near the Garden of Eden. The Tigris River comes from this mountain, uh, the Euphrates River. The sources come from this general mountain area. And the Bible even says four rivers came from the Tree of Life in Paradise. And the Paradise, uh, and this is exactly where these rivers are found even today uh, around the Mount Ararat area. Here's an aerial view of Mount Ararat. The area that I was going to be shown where they claim these new discoveries are found is called Red Canyon. And if you look at this picture, there's a dark area here. That is Red Canyon. It's on the south side of the mountain. Most people have looked for the ark when you hear all the stories over the last hundred years. They're looking on the other side, the other side of the mountain. Uh, as Indiana Jones says, they're looking in the wrong place. Okay, But uh, they have not found anything over here. It's a very dangerous place to work. An earthquake that occurred in 1840 destroyed a village that was on this side. This line, by the way, represents the border between Turkey and Armenia. Uh, that's a very, uh, Ararat's located in a very interesting place. Georgia, former Soviet Union, is very close by to the north. Then you have Armenia, Azerbaijan, and then Iraq. We can actually see the walls, the border walls from these various countries as they're working. And that's one reason why in the past it was hard to climb this mountain because 
uh, it was politically dynamite. It was too close to these other areas, and these countries don't necessarily like each other. Even today, there's sometimes struggles between the Kurds, some of the Kurds who live in eastern Turkey, and the Turks. And there's a revolutionary group of the Kurds that are constantly you know, using terrorist actions to uh, try and get their political goals met by, with the Turks. I don't intend to get into that too much. But one of the reasons people have had trouble climbing this mountain until recently is because it's a military zone. In fact, even one of my digs, I'll show you a few pictures, there was a bombing in Istanbul and they blamed the Kurds, the Turkish government did, and some of the Kurds are said to be hiding on Mount Ararat. That's one of their strongholds. And we've seen evidence of the revolutionary Kurdish army. Uh, they've shot some things up. We saw some tractors up there that they were trying to make a road up the mountain and the Kurds blew it up, shot it up and so forth. And we started to climb the mountain and uh, the military told us we had to be very careful because they thought there were Kurds in the area. In uh, fact, it was even suggested we not climb at all, but they didn't open it up. You had to stay in a very narrow area. You had to show your passports to the uh, Turkish army, and uh, they kept an eye on you to make sure that there were no problems. That was an interesting experience in and of itself. So anyway, we're going to be looking on the south side here very quickly. Well, a little bit of background to why people got curious about the south side of the mountain. In 1943, in the middle of World War II, there was a sergeant in the United States Army, while everyone was fighting in, you know, against Japan and Germany, we had certain things going on to help uh, the Russians, and we had military operations even in Iraq and Mesopotamia. Not a lot of fighting, but there were things that were going on there to help support the war effort. And so this U.S. Army sergeant was stationed in Iran, which is also very close to Mount Ararat. Iraq, Iran, uh, they're all, you know, all their borders kind of come together right in that area. He was asked after doing some work for the local Iranians, would he like to see Noah's Ark? They said it's on top of that big mountain with the two peaks. And he said, sure, you know, not very many people get there, but he thought, okay, this sounds kind of interesting. So uh, as a thank you, they took him up the mountain. He was helping them get some water for a village. Here's a picture of him before he passed away. He's in the red checkered shirt. Uh, uh, an Adventist artist named uh, Alfred Lees in the uh, right hand of the lower picture had uh, interviewed him and drawn pictures of how he described the wooden structure that he saw on the mountain in 1943. And Alfred Lee drew this uh, nice uh, map as well as a picture of the mountain and a picture of the ark as it was described to him. And uh, Ed Davis, Sergeant Davis, actually made a map showing what he saw when he was taken on the mountain. He seemed confused as to what side. When you're mountain climbing, it's easy since it's kind of a cylindrical thing, a cone, it's easy to kind of get disoriented. And you may think you're south when you're really southeast or southwest. And so he wasn't quite sure where he was, but he did draw a very accurate map. And this particular map, um, north is, and the top of the mountain's at the bottom, and south is at the top. This is Red Canyon. He was standing on the uh, left-hand side, kind of where the peak is, looking down. And he claims that he saw two wooden structures you can see one on the right side with a bit of glacier going over the top of it. He saw one great big wooden structure. And then it seemed like another piece of the wooden structure was broken off and was down slope. It's in the upper left hand part of this picture. Uh, there's also a location, I think it'll show up in the next picture, where there's a waterfall that freezes in the winter time. You can see the blue uh, purple arrow going up on the left hand from the top down to the bottom towards the peak. And that's one of the trails you can take. There's a trail on the other side of the canyon. This is very difficult climbing, hiking. It's volcanic, rocks. It's easy to fall, get hurt. You should never climb the mountain by yourself. People have tried it, and they've ended up dead. And the snow comes, and they freeze, and they find the bodies afterwards. You have, always should go with the proper training, proper guides, proper equipment to make sure that you can survive <laughs> the ordeal. On the right-hand side is an actual satellite image and it's showing a correlation between Ed Davis's map of 1943 and what the canyon looks like uh, in recent times from the satellite picture. And uh, if you look at the top right picture, you can see B site is the lower site heading to the south. That's where the big piece of uh, wood structure was found. And A site's very hard to get to. It's near the crown of the mountain on the side of an ice cliff. Very hard to get to. The two Kurdish guides got inside and they were claiming, they've told me that they found artifacts inside. Pottery, uh, they found rope, they found leather bags. You'll see some pictures of that in a few moments. 
And uh, they even found a holy book made out of leather, and it has gold illumination on the pages. These are illustrated, illuminated books, and it was a Christian book, actually. Now, that's interesting. Christians were up there probably somewhere between 8th century A.D. and 12th century A.D., my look and my preliminary dating of the book. I haven't seen the book in person. I've only seen the photographs of it. But they claim this all came from these structures up there. Now, that was interesting. The artifacts we can actually date. They date to different periods, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You have to climb Red Canyon in the winter. That's why we're going in a couple of weeks. It's now October because um, when the summer sun hits the canyon, it melts the ice in the rocks, and the rocks become very unstable. And it's not uncommon for rock slides to occur. These are very large boulders, the big of one of the size of one of uh, Denzel's trucks. You were showing me some trucks at a factory. That's how big some of these rocks are that come rolling down. If you get hit by one of those, obviously it's a deadly situation. So you want to wait till the ground is frozen to go up there to avoid any danger of rock slides from the top of the volcano. You can see the waterfall that appears on Sergeant Davis's map where the red arrow is pointing. In the winter, it's frozen. In the summer, it will melt. And you can see the water going down the canyon. So this is a view across Red Canyon from High Camp. Here's another view of it with some cloud and fog. You can see the very top of the mountains usually covered with snow uh, on top of a glacier. Here's a summer view. The glacier's melted, or the snow's melted back. We're shooting towards the top of the mountain, you can see that kind of cloudy dust cloud. That's actually one of the rock slides that occurred. Uh, the photographer was on the side of the canyon. You wouldn't want to be in the canyon when that comes rolling down on you. Here's another picture of where the rocks are sliding down, kicking up the, uh, the uh, dust. Again, that looks like it's harmless, but if you're there, it's very, very dangerous. And there's also, if you're curious, there's wild animals on the mountain, including bears and other things. So when you go on the mountain, in addition to keeping an eye out for terrorists, you keep an eye out for uh, bears and things like that. So they carry guns with them and uh, just in case they have to defend uh, the climbers. Now, the man that actually found this, this is his name, Ahmed Ertugrul. He, he goes by parachute, and he made this discovery uh, under the ice in Red Canyon of all these wood structures. Now, they had claimed to have been seen by Sergeant Davis in 1943 and by others, but he actually found that underneath the Rock and ice in Red Canyon was lots of timber. He found like 18 different holes in the glacier, in the rock and the ice, and he'd go down maybe uh, his uh, half the height of the ceiling, go down three or four meters, and he saw rooms, if you will, natural uh, spaces with all this broken up wood. Tremendous amount of lumber and timber there. A Chinese team joined him in 2008. Uh, this man goes by the name Panda Lee uh, from an organization searching for Noah's Ark. And they, uh, this is what it looks like inside one of the spaces. One of the most famous pictures, and this was published in newspapers around the world. I had just been in Hong Kong giving lectures to some Chinese Adventists, actually. They had two different language groups there. And I was sharing with them about biblical archaeology. This came out just after I left, and they wrote me immediately, emailed me, hey, Dr. Yonker, what do you think about this? And I was thinking, well, that's very interesting, but where was the picture taken? Well, we now know it was taken on Ari Dab. You can see we're in a corner of a room. The walls are made of uh, shaped wood, and there's a ceiling on top. You can see some ice is at the bottom of the ceiling there. No nails were used. The technique, actually, is a very old building technique, both for ships but also for houses. So we can't say, based on the building technique that we see in the pictures, whether this is a house or is it some other structure, or could it be Noah's Ark? You know, it's hard to say. I was told that they took C-14 sampling. I don't know that they knew how to do that. The oldest date they got was about 2000 BC, but the youngest date they got was about 100 years ago. So, but they were taking it from different places, and we have to study why were they getting different dates like that, what's going on here. But we're not sure ourselves how old this thing is. It needs to be properly tested. And that's one of the things we hope to do in our future research. So here he is inside, underneath the glacier, the ice, the rock, and so forth below. He's got his hand on a great big couple pieces of board, which was the side of an interior room, apparently. And this was one of the newspapers that I was sent. You know, is this a glimpse inside Noah's Ark? 
here are some of the pictures. Now, one of my colleagues who's joined the team, he uh, converted to Adventism. I mentioned him a little while ago, former Army officer. Uh, he has managed to collect thousands and thousands of photographs and videos. We have Andrews University with this team member has the largest collection of all this underground material. We're still analyzing it. We're taking pictures above. We've collected all these pictures trying to figure out what is this thing. Here are some of the pictures of the wood structure under about three or four meters of ice. We're talking about you know, like 15 feet or so of rock and ice, maybe more, 20 feet. We are not sure what we're looking at. It's clearly all human made. See these uh, large beams coming in, hooking into the side, the ceilings above the side of the left. Here's another uh, diangular cylindrical beam that's going across one of the rooms there, one of the sections of the rooms. Here's the guide's head in the left, and he's looking up at some of the uh, construction techniques in this room. You can see the lichen on the walls. You can see spider webs. Spiders are up there uh, inside the ruins of this thing, and that was kind of uh, getting the attention of my biology friends. Uh, here's some other photographs here. Just some various pictures of uh, the wood. You wear helmets, of course, because you never know when something's going to slip and fall on you, a rock, a big chunk of ice, if the ground shakes a little bit. This is a volcano, so that means you're prone to earthquake activity, too. So you keep ropes tied around your body, and you wear a helmet, and you try and reinforce everything so that you don't get hurt when you're climbing in. It's just like mountain climbing. It is mountain climbing. Now, here's uh, uh, per, these two people I know personally, Philip Williams in the blue jacket, Sheila Bishop, a, a lady with her head turned to the picture. They made a climb after the one you just saw the pictures from, and they asked me to join their organization. I've kind of participated with them a little bit. They went into the chamber and took a lot more pictures, but the guy in the blue coat, he went up there in only one day, and he got altitude sickness. He got so sick that after a short period of time, he went unconscious. They had to load him onto the horses. They go up by horses, take all the equipment. They took him down to the hospital emergency, and they're able to save him. But it's not a, um, what can I say, a joke just to go up there. Some people adjust to the altitude very well, but other people don't. Everyone's metabolism, their biochemistry, everything's a little different. So you have to prepare yourself properly. Usually the best thing is to stay up there at a lower elevation for at least 24 hours, get used to the lesser amount of oxygen, and then you can go up. I did, the first day, time I did it, I got just a slight tinge of a headache, but I was popping aspirin and doing all the things they told me to do. Second time, I had no problem at all when I went up there, so. And here's some other pictures of Red Canyon. If you look to the right, you can see the smaller volcano. By the way, on the shoulders of Mount Ararat are ancient archaeological sites. Some of them are from the kingdom of Ura, too. We want to explore those. And uh, we're visiting them in a preliminary fashion. We want to know who was living there when and what did they know about the mountain and did they have any stories of Noah's Ark. Some of our research is collecting all the poetry of all the people that live around Mount Ararat. We've discovered since the 1800s there are hundreds and hundreds of poems about Noah's Ark and Mount Ararat. So they clearly believe it's up there, but do the poems hide any evidence for us? We're actually gathering these, Dr. Belly. We're going to publish them through Andrews University. It'll be our third book on the research here. All the poems and stories that the people who have lived there for centuries that they tell about this mountain and their knowledge of the ark. Here you can see what Red Canyon looks like and how hard it is to climb. There's a man, if you see the green marker on the right, that's a man standing there. So when you're climbing, you have to use crampons on, you know, spikes on your boots, poles, ropes, and it's very hard to climb over the ice and the rock to, uh, to work up there. It's unlike any excavation I've ever done. Usually we just lay out a nice square grid system on flat land or the telves, and we dig down. And like Gezer, you know, I talked about last night, we just dig down and find what we're looking for. There's architecture and buildings. This is more like an airplane crash on the side of a mountain. It's not your normal excavation or trying to find a shipwreck at the bottom of the sea. You don't just walk out there and start digging. You have to have special equipment to go to the bottom of the ocean. There are archaeologists trained to do that. And for doing this kind of archaeology, it's a whole different methodology. So it's very challenging to do it right, to document it correctly, and not get yourself killed by falling. Here's some uh, more photographs from uh, Phillips. Uh, this is 2014, where they're inside some of the rooms covered with snow and ice. 
their boots. There's wood pieces sticking out of the snow and ice there. This is the side of a room on the right side, all covered with ice that kind of melted and made a sheet of ice on top of the wood structure. This is part of the ceiling. You can see long beams coming out. Some of them are broken and fallen. The big thing that impresses us is how much wood there is. Now, these are smaller boards. In some of the rooms, there's tremendous amounts of wood, uh, long, you know, uh, big, thick beams that came from large trees. Now, some of the local people, they've become jealous of this discovery, and they're making an accusation that some of the Kurdish guides, in order to promote tourism, carried the wood up there and left it and said, this is the destruction of Noah's Ark. Uh, my feeling about that, I think they could have done some of that, but um, I don't think they could have brought all of that wood up there that we're finding. The quantity and the weight is just too great to bring it all up on horseback in a short period of time. We do know that in ancient times, people would make temples on tops of mountains in Asia. Some of you heard of these famous monasteries way up on top of mountains, but those weren't built in just a few months uh, by people bringing up some boards and horseback. They took many, many years to carry all that material up there and construct it very carefully. It was a major operation. So what we're seeing, in my opinion, is the remains of a major operation. Certainly people have brought wood up since, maybe to buttress something up, to add something, but uh, some of that it looks like it's very very old, the question is how old. So here's some more additional photographs here. You can see where they cut grooves and they slide the boards in, they cut dowels and stick them in the wood and so forth. So some interesting building techniques here. Getting, giving you a chance to look at the pictures, get an idea. And there's many, many more photographs. These are just a few that we selected quickly, but uh, uh, I, there's even some new ones. I haven't even seen them all yet. So uh, they're coming out. Here's a board that's broken. And you can see this, uh, this is a wall of wood going in for like 30 meters. It's a considerably long corridor inside this structure. Was it something inside the ark? Was it some other kind of a building that was built up there? That's the big question we have. But it's on the mountain associated with Noah. So this is very fascinating to us. Uh, just to prove that I'm not just telling you someone else's story, this is me not too long ago uh, below Mount Ararat. This is one of my two climbs up. And uh, this will give you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like to climb. We use horses, a horse train. There's special Turkish ponies. I think they're descendants from the Uratu horses because in ancient times, the Urtu people lived on these mountains, and they had horses to help them get up and down. The Assyrians from Mesopotamia Valley, big flat area where the rivers were, they liked to steal the horses from the people of the mountains because they were sturdy ponies, and they could pull their chariots and so forth. So there was constant warfare between the people of the mountains, the Urtu people, and the Assyrians and the people from Mesopotamia. So we had to get 20 of these old horses, the descendants of the ancient ponies. They carry all of our stuff up there all of our tents, all of our food, uh, all of our sleeping bags, our stove, everything like that, and even wood for burning fires. So we're bringing up modern wood, which can actually add to the confusion. So here's the route that we took going up the mountain. You can see the red line. <clears throat> we go, uh, we actually drive to a certain uh, degree where there's no snow, there's a rough road that's built there. Then we have to get out and we get the horses and we start hiking up the mountain. And of course, sometimes there's not a lot of snow, sometimes there's, there's uh, quite a bit of snow. When we climbed up, there wasn't too much at the beginning, but we got snowed on as we were climbing up the mountain, which made it a little bit more difficult. It's very cold on top of the mountain. You have to have proper equipment. And at times, you, you're working, you get very warm, you take your outer layers off, then you get very cold, you put them back on. You're, there's a constant battle. If you get too sweaty, take your coat off, you'll actually freeze from your own sweat. Your clothes will just turn like an icicle. So you have to know when to dress up and when to dress down to climb this. Uh, this is a picture of me with one of, this is another one of our military guys. He's not an Adventist. He's a Christian, very devout Christian, uh, evangelist actually, but he's former military too, and he's training. He was in the Air Force. He taught mountain survival. If you're an airplane gets shot down, this is how you survive. So he was a great asset for us because he has great mountain climbing skills from his training in the Air Force as a survival officer. 
And so we had two Army guys, uh, former military guys with the Air Force and Army, actually. So here we are uh, getting ready to climb up towards the uh, Red Canyon. You can see how rocky things are. There's no trail, no path. They say there's a trail, but really it's just a place you walk up. Generally, it's the least dangerous place, but it's all very rocky. You constantly have to watch so you don't slip and fall, step in between rocks and get caught. So here's a little bit of video to give you an idea. I don't know if the sound's hooked up. Maybe it's just as well because you're homie. Oh, here's some sound. The guy in the red pants is our guide, our Kurdish guide. This is just part of our team, this particular climb. And the next day it had snowed, we were at first camp. I'm wearing the red coat. That's because I'm the professor, and I want to make it easy for them to find my body in case I slip and fall. Everyone else is wearing different, darker clothes, but they can always find me because I'm wearing red. I was the oldest guy on the climbing team. They were a little surprised how old I was. Denzel found out at breakfast this morning. Most of them thought I was a little bit younger. That's uh, because of the good Adventist health message, right? But uh, I'm getting up there. I'm past retirement age, in case you're curious. I have moved from the Iron Age to the early Bronze Age in my chronological life, okay? So I was climbing up there. Uh, we're in the snow here. And I think this might be a little bit of the video, give you an idea. You hear the wind all the time blowing. with Mount Ararat has a cloud ring around it. It comes and it goes. It's a special phenomenon from the pressure and the temperature and the atmosphere. It's beautiful. And here we are getting close to second camp. We'll descend into Red Canyon where the wood is in a little bit. It had just snowed, so we had to watch our footing very carefully. Sometimes you're in fog. Sometimes you're suddenly in clear blue skies. The weather's changing all the time. It's an amazing experience. I'm still alive and we're covering you up with stuff. <laughs> I think this is one of our rest stops. <coughs> Volcanic rock everywhere. I think I'm eating a snack bar just to give my oh, I'm getting a drink of water here in the red coat. Okay. It looks like there's a road down below, but that's actually from a, a, a flood of water that came down from the summer or, or some kind of a landslide. So there's no road. They actually, the military is building a road now. That's another story. We may be able to use that in the future. But uh, when the air is clear, sometimes the clouds disappear, you can see all the other mountains of Ararat. The mountains of Ararat, they're the highest peaks, all above 13,000 feet. It's absolutely fantastic, beautiful. And ancient people used to live there in Bible times. In fact, we know that text, we talk about two texts, Ezekiel and Isaiah talks about, you know, Lucifer challenging God. He wants to put his throne upon, you know, the high mountain above God. We think now he's talking about Mount Ararat because that was the highest mountain. And we know Sargon, the Assyrian king, who's a type of Lucifer, actually made that claim for himself, and he died there and never got back home. He's one of the few Assyrian kings. We don't have a sarcophagus. They wanted to put their throne on top of this mountain because they thought it would reach to heaven where God was. And here's another view. You can see some of our horses in this video right here. And I'm in the red coat, desperately trying to get out of the way. They're telling me to get out of the way. These are amazing horses because they understand Turkish. All the guys are shouting to the horses in Turkish. And they're carrying all of our supplies. I just got out of the way there, and they're heading on up. They will pass us. They go up to high camp where we want to do our research, and they build the camp. They have the tent set up, the food cooking, and everything. So when you get there, it's all arranged for us. That's part of the way it works. Very nice thing. Here are the horse. You can see the top of the mountain behind us. It looks close, but it's a long ways off. It's another day's climb. And then watch this guy that has the horses go by. You see the ice picks and everything on the back of the horses. See this man riding, and I keep wondering, how come he's on a horse and I'm not? I'm the professor, you know? So we're going to have a discussion about that. <laughs> Maybe next time I'll get to ride the horse, let him walk. We'll see about that. And then here we are. Just really, we're getting above the clouds now up at second camp. 
and we're getting ready to have our supper. And then the next morning, that's like the third or fourth day, we're going to go into Red Canyon. And this is the next morning. It was sunny. Fortunately, we're on the edge of the canyon. We got, have to go down into this canyon where the wood structures are located. But it had just snowed, so we only saw a little bit of the wood. But it's very steep. Look how we came from the upper left-hand thing. We had to descend into the canyon. It's very steep. Uh, our team was all roped together so nobody would slip and fall by themselves. You know, if somebody slips, the other guys hang onto the rope and keep them from having disaster. So they're, they're descending down to the area where the wood, and we found wood down there, and it was clearly uh, human worked. Uh, the, the sad news on this particular board was we did a C-14 test of it, and it's only about 150, 200 years old. So this board was brought up later. And we talked to the guys, and they said, well, they brought some of the wood up to support, you know, prevent uh, collapse and to protect the doorways or the openings in. So this is not from Noah's Ark. Uh, it's an older piece of wood. I think it might precede the guides, though. We have found some evidence that people were up there 150 years ago, and they were doing something up in these buildings. We're not sure what. So we're doing some investigation of that. And this is me after I've come down from that particular climb. I'm smiling, but my whole body feels very <laughs> stiff and sore. So we made a second climb uh, since then, again, recently. And this is the one where I fell and got hurt. But it was not on the mountain. Actually, uh, I was taking a shower before I climbed the mountain, or after I climbed the mountain, and I slipped in the bathroom. What a stupid thing to do. Uh, all the floors of the hotel were marble, and I got a shower, and boom, bang. You know? So I climbed the mountain. I'm OK. In the bathroom, I have my accident. So here I am with my climbing poles. This was a time when the Kurds were on the mountain and they were afraid of terrorist activity. So there were Turkish army soldiers everywhere and they told us to be very careful. If we got out of a certain area, they might think we're terrorists running around, we might get shot. And so we stayed on the main trail and hiked up to Red Canyon. Here is our horse train. And sure enough, this is low camp now. We have our cook tent there. This is my second climb up. <clears throat> there had been some snow. And while we were there, a team of Turkish soldiers, nine of them came, they had their guns. They were building a road up for military defense purposes to defend against the Kurdish rebels. And uh, so suddenly, they told us, don't take any pictures. We want to take pictures of the soldiers and everything, of course. That's interesting. No pictures, no photos. And they checked our passports. They were not friendly. They did not smile. And then they went up and stood guard over watching us, you know, with their guns, and they were working on the road. Suddenly, this bald man comes over the hill with a whole bunch of other soldiers. There are like about 30, 40 men. They show up on the top of Mount Area. I mean, you know, at the first camp. And I was wondering, who are these guys? And they were all happy. And it turned out that that man uh, on the left there was the governor of the province. And he wanted to make sure that we were OK. He actually climbed up there and wanted to say, are you being treated well? Are the soldiers being nice to you? And with him are two officers. These are generals of the army. And uh, they were smiling at me. And uh, you know, I said, yeah, everything's great. And he says, you know, Noah's Ark's up there. I said, well, we've been told that. You know, this is something we're interested in. And so he was very happy. And we said, can we take pictures? He said, sure. The soldiers had said no, but now we had the general and the governor with us, so it was OK. So we started taking pictures all over the place. And here I am in my red coat next to the governor. And that's my Air Force guy on the other side and some of the rest of our team. So we suddenly were able to take pictures. And the soldiers, they talked to the soldiers. And they suddenly started smiling. And they came down and were very friendly with us. And we could take all the pictures we want. We gave them tea and cheese and bread. And they were very happy. One of them was so happy. He was eating his cheese, and his officer said, OK, it's time to go. And so he ran off, and he left his machine gun with me. And I was looking at this great big machine gun, I don't know, 50 caliber something or other. And uh, when he finally got to the hill, he realized he forgot his gun. I was just standing there looking at it, you know. He sheepishly came back down and says, I need my gun back, picked it up, and ran off to join his <laughs> friends. I certainly wouldn't have known what to do with it, but it was impressive looking. So they were very nice to us, and we were able to then continue on with our uh, research. Let's see. I seem to. Trying to get here we go. So I was explaining to him about our research there and what we were doing, and he was very supportive. So this was actually a very providential encounter to meet uh, the high governor official for this whole region. They have since turned this from a military zone into a park. They feel they got the terrorist situation under control. We're going back in a couple of weeks, and now we're free to go wherever we want on the mountain. And so we will be going back to Red Canyon and taking more photographs and documenting this. And you can see all of our pictures. The press was there, actually. So we appeared in the newspapers over in Turkey the next uh, couple of days there. 
And then you can see the governors going up. There's a, in the right-hand picture on top of the rocks is one of the soldiers that was guarding us. And he goes up, the governor, and tells him to treat us in a good way. And that's when they came down and had tea with us. And then, of course, at sundown, you get these spectacular views up there. And uh, this is just one of the wonderful uh, color shots of what it's like to be. You feel like you're on top of the world. And then here I am at the edge of Red Canyon the next day. And the sky was very deep blue. And uh, we got some great photographs. So, but we're still continuing our research. Here's a, a shot across Red Canyon and the uh, waterfall coming down. So now just sort of a little summary for you. Where are we at? Uh, I can't say we have found Noah's Ark yet. We're still in the middle of our research. But this, I believe, is the right mountain. I've done a paper, published it, on why I think this is the correct mountain. That would be a different presentation. But what they have found is a lot of wood pottery and artifacts that have come from the mountain and from the structure. What do these things tell us about this structure up there? Uh, the wood itself, we've got dates from the wood. Uh, people are saying it was planted there by locals to draw attention, but we know some of the wood is much older. The C14 dates go to 2000 BC to about the Middle Ages, which would be about 1200 AD, 8 to 1200 AD. And then some of the stuff is the wood is as old as about 150 years ago. That's the Ottoman period. So we've got Ottoman, the Middle Ages, and all the way back to Abraham. That's what I have seen so far. So what does that tell me? In addition to the wood dates that we have so far, we found a lot of artifacts, of course. I'm kind of skipping through the writing here. This is the C14 range we have. We're going to be doing a lot more sampling as our goal. I'm trying to get to the actual photographs here. So what could be up on the mountain? This is what we're considering. Um, it was told to us that it was not possible to climb the mountain because it was a holy mountain and God forbade it. Okay? And so for many centuries, people were told they can't go up there because this is the mountain where God lives. Okay? And uh, he, God came down to this mountain. Of course, recent times, people have gone up there, and we've discovered they were going up there through all the centuries anyway. So what would the wooden structures be? I think there could be more than one. I think that people thought this was Noah's Ark, and so they climbed up there as pilgrims. Pilgrims like to go to holy places. I've been on Mount Sinai several times because we believe that's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and you can hike up there to this day. Uh, and people will make shelters on these places. You can buy uh, hot drinks on Mount Sinai today and food and so forth, and you can rest in one of these shelters. So could there be pilgrim rest shelters built on Mount Ararat? so that pilgrims could go up and see the ark. Could there be animal shelters? Because we saw that their people still raise their animals. Sheep and goats live on the side of the mountain, and the uh, shepherds will take them high up the mountain to find grass and things like that. Not quite this high, though, but you do find animal shelters. Could the ancient people have built a religious shrine because they thought, this is Noah's ark, and we want to pray and worship? That's very common in holy places. Almost any holy mountain will have a shrine on it, including in Israel, you know, Mount Hermon, Mount Tabor, where they thought Jesus, you know, met Elijah and Moses. There are holy places where people can worship. Did ancient people build a religious shrine up there? Could that be some of the wood? Did they ever make a monastery where monks can go and live and pray on top of the mountain? We see this in other parts of the world. It's away from the sins of the world, close to God. It's a great place to be isolated. Could there have been a temple in antiquity there? And this, to me, is an interesting uh, possibility because in the Gilgamesh story, it says that after the ark landed on its mountain, uh, and by the way, the word for mountain in uh, Gilgamesh is a strange word. It means secret place. It's not called Ararat Mountain. It's called the mountain that's a hidden or secret place, which means we weren't supposed to go up there. We weren't supposed to know where it was. And uh, Gilgamesh says that the ark turned into a temple, a ziggurat. Now, that's interesting. Could people in Gilgamesh's time, we think he was a real person, did they go up to the ark and turn it into a temple? And Gilgamesh suggests that they would continue to worship, and some scholars believe that's what happened, that uh, they would go up and do ceremonies because this was the most important temple in the world. In a way, it was the highest one closest to God. And so this is how you could get salvation. The ark was one way of gaining salvation. After the flood is over, it was maybe taught that people could go up there and gain salvation by worshiping at this temple. It would be a pagan temple, of course, in our view. But could there be a temple up there? Uh, there was, there's even a story from the Middle Ages that some monks went up on this mountain. They built a copy of Noah's house. They said after Noah left the ark, he took some of the wood and he built himself a house to live in. 
That's not inconceivable. Maybe they did disassemble part of the Ark Noah's family, and they built some structures to live in. And uh, these monks actually built a replica and had pilgrims come up. Maybe they told them it was the real room of Noah, and they came up to visit it, leave offerings, and so forth. So this is another possibility. The point is there are real artifacts on the mountain, and there's real wood, and it's dating from different periods. Why did they go up there? The only plausible explanation, in my opinion, is they thought this was where the ark landed. And so this all just kind of adds to the story. But the story is more complicated than we thought. And so one of our goals is to continue to work on this. And I'll just kind of close quickly because it's our time now. But here's some examples of wood that have been collected. This is from 1955, a man named Navarra. Frenchman climbed up there. His wood dated to the 7th, 8th centuries AD. That's not as old as Noah, but it does indicate people were doing something on the mountain up there. Were they building a shrine or something to worship at? Here's some of the pictures of the wood. This is some other wood from 1969. The dates of the wood we have are 2000 BC, 8th century AD, and 19th century. This fits the artifacts that have come from the mountain. Here's some of the boards again, a little repeat. This wooden structure, this artifact was brought to me from the mountain by one of the guides, and he didn't know what it was. I immediately recognized it. It's a coffee grinder, and it dates to the 19th century. So I told him that he was surprised. You know, He didn't know what this was. I said, well, some Ottoman... Muslim has been on the mountain making coffee on top of Noah's Ark. Apparently, they were up there doing something or other, but that shows that activity was going up there, even when it was said to be a forbidden mountain. They brought me this jar that came from the wooden structure, and this was interesting because it has a design of animals on it, and we could date that precisely to the 11th and 12th century A.D. This is the Middle Ages. That's way earlier than the Ottoman cooking pot. So this was a big food store jar. So somebody was going up there carrying big jars, and they had food up there. And they were doing, having a picnic on top of Noah's Ark. I don't know. But the, this came from the top of the mountain. Here's an example of what the full jar looks like. We have copies from other sites. That's how we could date it nearby Mount Ararat. And so we can date that. Here's this village where the pottery was made. And there's Mount Ararat in the distance. And some of the pottery was found on that mountaintop there. And then this is some of our team that uh, were working in the area, right? They were visiting uh, the archaeological sites below. This was the gospel book. This also dates to the 12th century, just like the wood, 8th to 12th century. People are up there worshiping. This is a book, if you can look closely, you can see on the bottom right-hand picture, that's a gold copy of the cross. That's the Armenian Christian cross. On the left is a picture of Jesus and Mary, baby Jesus and Mary. So we have evidence that Christians are up there worshiping as well. Why were they going up there? Why did they leave their holy book in this wooden structure? So this is what we're finding archaeologically. And then we found these bronze vessels. These date to about the time of Abraham, and they were found on the mountain also. So what this is telling us with the wood dates, C14 dates, and the artifacts, people have been going up there leaving things behind for a long time. But we haven't been able to complete our research yet and that's why we're going to go back and look at this. This could, of course, be one of the most exciting and fascinating discoveries in the world. It's not quite as dramatic here for you, but it gives you a little bit of an inside look at how we do this work. And uh, God willing, if this is important, we'll be able to get a full picture of what's going on and then be able to share this uh, with the world. So uh, there are other claims of Noah's Ark. Uh, this is uh, the Ron Wyatt site. It looks like a boat-shaped thing. Uh, but it's actually a geological formation. We, I've climbed all over it. We studied it. There's no evidence of wood there in spite of the claims that there is. So we know that's not where the ark is. I think it's more likely going to be on top of the mountain. So we're continuing our research. And this is just a view of the same area. This is very close to Mount Ararat. The high ridge you see in the background is the border with Iraq. That's how close we are to the Iraqis in this particular area. And here you can see I'm looking along the side of the so-called ark there, exploring it. So... Uh, and here's our, our final shot. I'm standing on the uh, one claim to be an ark, you know, this geological thing, and you can see Mount Ararat's right behind us, the Twin Peak Mountain. So that gives you an idea of what we're doing. Uh, after our potluck, we're going to have a chance for questions. I have more information, and there will be an opportunity after the potluck lunch to share more with you. So this is a little bit of deliberate hook. If you want to hear the rest of the story, come this afternoon.